For now, I'm going to tell you a tale, which I will tell with a lot of skill. However, before I begin my story, I will pour myself a cup of this fine Jamaican, and I will make a big sign of the cross to protect myself against the devil and his minions. I have had my fair share of those cursed creatures in my younger days. If I was a little rough in my youth, I no longer make fun of religious matters. I go to confession regularly every year, and the story I'm about to tell you happened in those days when I feared neither God nor devil. I have worked in the camps for almost 40 years, ever since I was a young lad. The lumberjack life is all I know, and anyway, it's the only thing that earns you a living in the new world. A man will get used to the snow and the cold of the Quebec winters, but he will never get used to being away from his friends and family, and the lovely Liza Gimbet, for his heart will always be with his home, which in my case was Lavaltri, a two-month trip from the Ottawa lumber camps. It was a night just like this one, 30 years ago on New Year's Eve, in the year 1858. My friends and I were having a drink to celebrate the New Year, but if small streams make big rivers, small glasses eventually empty big jugs and in those days we drank harder and more often than today. You can imagine that on such a festive night, some men get rowdier than others. And when mixing Jamaican with the solitude of the camps, it was not uncommon for the festivities to end in punches and hair pulling. The Jamaican was good, not better than tonight, but it was damn good, I assure you. For my part, I had downed about half a dozen small cups, and around 11 o'clock, I confess, my head was spinning, and I let myself fall onto my sled fur I had set by the fireplace for a little nap while waiting for midnight, when it is time to jump over a barrel of lard, as is tradition for the new year, and go sing carols to the men in the neighboring camps. I'd been sleeping for quite some time when I was roughly shaken by the chief lumberjack, Baptiste Durand. Joe, midnight just struck and you're late for the barrel jump. The guys have left to sing their carols in the camp up north and I'm going to Laval Tree to see my girlfriend. Do you want to come with me? To Laval Tree? Have you lost your mind? We're over a hundred miles away. Besides, even if you had two months to make the trip, there's no way out in this heavy snow. And what about work tomorrow morning? No, silly. That's not what I'm talking about. We'll make the trip in a bark canoe rowing, and tomorrow morning at six o'clock, we'll be back at the logging camp. I understood. Baptiste was suggesting that we take the devil's canoe through the skies and risk our eternal salvation for the pleasure of going to see our loved ones back in the village. It is well known that in the camps, some godless men like to make pacts with the devil and risk it all for an easy fix to their solitude. My mother had warned me, but it is true that I was a bit of a drunk and a debaucher in those days, and that I wasn't particularly concerned with religion. However, the idea of selling my soul to the devil was beyond what I was willing to do. Come on, you chicken. You know there's no danger. We just have to go to Lavaltry and come back in six hours. You know that with the flying canoe, we can cover at least 50 leagues an hour when we know how to handle the oar like we do. Yes, all of that sounds good. I agree. But one must make a deal with the devil, and he is an animal that takes commitments very seriously. A simple formality, Joe. The deal was a simple one in appearance. All we had to do during our voyage was not utter the name of the Lord or his son, nor touch a cross or the roof of a church, and be back before the crack of dawn. And in exchange, the Dark One would take us wherever our hearts desired in our barkwood canoe. Come on, let's go. Our companions are waiting for us outside, and the canoe is ready for the journey. Still half asleep, I let myself be led out of the cabin, where I indeed saw the rest of the men waiting for us, paddle in hand. I admit that I was a little unsettled, but Baptiste, who was well known in the camp for not having been to confession for seven years, did not give me time to sort myself out. The large canoe was on the snow, in a clearing right outside my cabin, and before I had time to think, I was already sitting in the front, 
my paddle hanging over the gunwale, waiting for the signal to depart. Baptiste took his place at the very back of the canoe, and with a vibrant voice he said, Repeat after me! Satan, king of the underworld, we promise to deliver our souls to you, if within the next six hours we utter the name of your master and ours, the good God, and if we touch a cross or the rooftop of a church on the journey. On this condition, you will transport us through the air to the place we want to go, and you will bring us back to the camp in the same way. A cabris! A cabris! A cabrum! Let us fly over the mountain. We had barely spoken the last few words when we felt the canoe rise into the air to a height of five or six hundred feet. With the first strokes of our paddles, the canoe shot forward like an arrow, and it's safe to say that the devil himself was carrying us away. We were moving faster than the wind. For about a quarter of an hour, we sailed above the forest without seeing anything other than the clusters of large black pines. The night was magnificent, and the full moon illuminated the sky like a beautiful midday sun. Soon, we spotted a clearing in the distance. It was the Gatineau River, whose icy and polished surface sparkled beneath us like an immense mirror. Then gradually, we saw lights in the houses of inhabitants, then church steeples that gleamed like soldiers' bayonets. We passed those church towers as quickly as telegraph poles when traveling by train, and we continued to speed along like devils, jumping over villages, forests, rivers, and leaving behind us a trail of sparks. Baptiste, who at this point seemed to be completely possessed, was in control because he knew the way. And soon we arrived at the Ottawa River, which served as our guide to descend to the Lake of Two Mountains. We could already see the thousand lights of the city of Montreal, and with a stroke of his paddle, Baptiste brought us down to about the level of the towers of Notre Dame. Be careful, we mustn't touch any of the church towers. I have done this seven times before. I know my way around. Then I began to count the church towers, those of Longue Pointe, Pointe aux Trombi, Repentigny, Saint-Sulpice, and finally the two silver spires of Laval Tree, which towered over the green tops of the large pine trees on the estate. Watch out, men! We're going to land at the entrance of my godfather Jean-Jean Gabriel's field. And as it was said, it was done. And five minutes later, our canoe rested in a snowbank at the entrance of Jean-Jean Gabriel's woods, and all of us set off in single file to go to the village. I can tell you it was no small task, as there was no beaten path, and we had snow up to our waists. Baptiste, more audacious than the others, went to knock on the door of his father-in-law's house, where light could still be seen. But he only found a servant girl who told him that the old folks were at a snack at Father Robillard's, and that all the boys and the girls of the parish were all gone to Batisset Auger's house in the community of Petite Misère, on the other side of the river, where there was a New Year's party going on. So we returned to the canoe, while naturally being very cautious not to utter certain words, and drinking too much, because we had to resume the journey to the logging camp, and arrive there before six in the morning. Otherwise we would be in trouble and the devil would take us to the depths of hell. A cabris, a cabris, a cabrum, let us fly over the mountains. As we were walking the empty streets of Petite Misère toward Batisset's house, we could already hear in the distance the music and the people singing songs for the new year. As we came closer, a warm feeling started to take over me, and the excitement of seeing my friends and loved ones again took over, and I couldn't wait to see my sweetheart Lisa Gimbet and have her dance the rigodon with me. Before reaching the doorstep, Baptiste warned us one last time. Now, no foolishness, boys. Watch your words and make sure to keep from drinking too much. We only have two hours, and we must keep our part of the deal with the Dark One. As we knocked on the door, Batisset's father himself came to open, and we were warmly welcomed by the guests, whom we almost all knew. Of course, they bombarded us with questions. Where are you coming from? 
I thought you were still in the logging camps. You're arriving so late. Come have a drink. Come. Baptiste, the smooth talker that he was, managed to dodge the questions and assured our hosts we would explain everything in the morning, but that for now we were hungry and thirsty, and we wanted to dance. I had already cast my eye on Lisa Gimbet, who was being courted by the little Boisjoli from Lanoré. I approached her to say hello and ask for the pleasure of the next dance. She accepted with a smile that made me forget that I had risked the salvation of my soul just to have the pleasure of dancing and flapping my wings with her. For two hours straight, I can assure you, one dance followed another, and it's not to boast if I tell you that at that time there was not a man who danced better than me within ten miles. My companions, for their part, were having a blast, and all I can tell you is that the other boys from the village were getting tired of us. I thought I saw Baptiste approach the buffet where the men were occasionally taking swigs of white whiskey, but I was so busy with my partner that I didn't pay much attention to it. It is only when one of the other men tapped me on the shoulder and pointed that I saw Baptiste stumble and fall over as the others were cheering him on. Immediately my eyes looked at the clock and I saw that it was already 4.30 and we had missed our departure time. I ran and pulled Baptiste by the arm, signaling to the others that it was time. We left the dance like savages without saying goodbye, not even to Liza, to whom I had promised one last dance. As we stumbled in a hurry towards the clearing where we had left our canoe, I clearly saw that Baptiste had had one too many drinks. This was a problem, because he was the one who was steering us and we only had just enough time to get back to the logging camp by six in the morning before our souls belonged to the devil. The moon had now disappeared and clouds were starting to cover the sky. It wasn't as bright as before. I took my position at the front of the canoe with some fear, but determined to keep an eye on the route we were taking. Before we took off, I turned around and said to Baptiste, be careful there, my friend. Head straight towards the mountain of Montreal as soon as you can see it. I know what I'm doing, and mind your own business. Acabras, Acabras, Acabra, let us fly over the mountain. And off we went at full speed, but it immediately became evident that our pilot no longer had a steady hand, as the canoe was making alarming zigzags. We passed no more than a hundred feet from the church tower of Contrecoeur. And instead of heading west toward Montreal, Baptiste made us tack toward the Richelieu River. We flew like a bullet over the mountain of Belloué, and it was not more than ten feet that the bow of the canoe missed crashing into the large temperance cross that the Bishop of Nancy had planted there. To the right, Baptiste, to the right! You'll send us straight to the devil if you don't steer better than that! Baptiste instinctively turned the canoe to the right, heading towards the mountain of Montreal, which we could already see in the distance. By now the fear was beginning to twist me up, for if Baptiste continued to lead us astray, we were as good as cooked pigs grilled after the slaughter. And I assure you that our downfall didn't take long to happen, because as we were passing over Montreal, Baptiste lost control, and in no time the canoe sank into a snowbank on the side of the mountain. Fortunately, it was soft snow, no one was hurt, and the canoe wasn't broken. We had barely gotten out of the snow when Baptiste started swearing as if possessed, and declared that before heading back to Gatineau, he wanted to go down to the city for a drink. There was no way we were leaving our souls to the devil, who was already licking his chops at seeing us in trouble. I turned to the other men, who were as afraid as I was, and said, Tie him up, boys! We all pounced on Baptiste, and without hurting him, we tied him up like a piece of sausage and put a gag in his mouth to prevent him from saying forbidden words when we would be in the air. We placed him at the bottom of the canoe, and then we set off again at breakneck speed, because we only had an hour left to get to the Ottawa camp. I was the one steering this time, and I assure you I had my eye open, and a strong arm. We raced up the Ottawa River like a whirlwind until we reached Pointe Gatineau, and from there we headed north towards the camp. 
We were only a few leagues away when that animal, Baptiste, wriggled free from the rope with which we had tied him up, ripped off his gag, and stood up straight in the canoe, gesticulating like a hanged man, and cursing in a way that made my hair stand on end. What did you do to me, you bastards? I'm in charge here. I'll show you. <laughs> there was no way of fighting back without risking falling from a height of 300 feet. And then, to every man's horror, in his fit of rage, Baptiste uttered, God damn all of you! Baptiste, no! The situation was terrible. Fortunately, we were approaching our destination. But as Baptiste swung his paddle at me one more time, I made a false maneuver and the canoe hit the head of a big pine tree. We all went tumbling down, falling from branch to branch. I don't know how long it took me to get down because I lost consciousness along the way, and my last memory was that of falling into a bottomless well. Around eight o'clock in the morning, I woke up at the bottom of my bed in the cabin, where the lumberjacks who found us unconscious, buried up to our necks in a nearby snowbank, had transported us. As I looked around the room, I saw the other men, but not a trace of Baptiste Durand. The man who had outsmarted the devil seven times before had finally ended up in the depths of hell. At least the devil had not taken us all. Needless to say, I did not rush to deny those who claimed to have found me and the other four men all drunk as skunks, trying to sleep it off in a snowbank nearby. They had no idea, and for a long time I kept what had happened a secret. After all, it's not very dignified to have almost sold your soul to the devil, and it was only many years later that I told the story as it had happened. Poor Liza Gumbet, she had waited for me to return that night. I left her heartbroken. It is not a surprise she ended up marrying the little Boisjoli, and she didn't even invite me to the wedding. All I can tell you, my friends, is that it's not as funny as you might think to go visit your sweetheart in a birch bark canoe in the middle of winter, especially if you have a damn drunkard trying to steer. But if you youngsters ever find yourself in a flying canoe, make sure it's on a night where the owls are gathering for their Sabbath, as it is said the devil watches you through their eyes. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of The Mystery Library. A big thank you to all of you who subscribed, and if you would like to support me, leave a like on this video and share it with your friends. Let me know in the comments which story I should do next. Until next time, stay wondrous, my friends. <laughs>